I usually begin a new chapter by reading the entire chapter. I'm going to do this. Now, this, this chapter um, is a chapter that some, in the, in, even in the grace message, see differently than what I see. And it, it, it has to do with um, human government, in my estimation, from what I see. Um, it's not just this uh, chapter. It's a couple other passages in Paul's epistles. And we're going to see some things about how shall we, as grace believers, relate to not only the other saints that we are around, the body of Christ, and not only to our lost neighbors, to our left and right where we live, but the authorities that we're born into. We, we were all born here in America, most, I guess, I'm, I'm assuming, we're all born here in America. We didn't have a choice. And growing up, there's this system of government that we, were, we are under. We were under and we are under. And from what I'm seeing here, just like Paul under that Roman government, he's going to give instructions, and he's talking to the Romans here, he's giving them instructions on how to deal with Caesar and those who are under Caesar. How do you deal with those lost Gentile heathens who are over you? Do you fight them? Do you resist them? Or do you submit to them? And are there times when, if you are to submit to them, that you don't submit to them? We're going to look at that, and that's what I see here. I'm going to read something. Now, I bring this up because Brother Dwayne is, is, is a Bible teacher here as well. He's our beloved brother, very faithful. Um, people ask me, says, do you and Dwayne disagree with anything? I said, 99.9% .9 of stuff we agree. You know, I'm talking about the, the, there, there are things, you know, little non-essentials. You're always going to disagree. Everybody's not going to see everything the same. But here, I do let him know, when it comes to p political things, governmental things, Dwayne and I do differ. I'm not going to present his side. You can ask him yourself. He put together a, 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 um, like a 20-something page thing on his thoughts. I did, too, because another brother had asked me to do it. And I'll make this available if you want, but I'm going to teach it. So I'm going to read some of this as well. So please just bear with me, because it's, it's my thoughts. Um, I put this over, over the course of a few days. And uh, I'll make it available for anyone. But if you want to know what Dwayne believes, I, just ask him, and he'll tell you. We disagree on, on, on this particular issue, which is, you know, is our, our prerogative, okay? Um, I wrote here, I said, imagine for a moment that your house is on fire and you have no way to put the fire out yourself. Or imagine, if you will, someone is breaking into your home at night with a gun and you are unarmed. What do you do? Do you call 911? Do you want your local fire department to come put out the fire? Or would you like your local police department to come and stop and catch the home uh, invading criminal? If so, who pays their wages? Do you pay them? Do I pay them? We will answer these questions later in the context of this study. This study states what, in writing what Brother Ron Knight uh, believes our Apostle Paul is instructing us in relationship to governmental authorities we live among. These instructions are found in three passages, Romans 13, 1 Timothy 2, and Titus 3. Now, before I read the passage here, go with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. There are going to be some obscure passages in, in the scriptures. But then there are going to be times where it's overwhelming evidence. And what, what constitutes overwhelming evidence to believe something? Well, Paul is going to tell the Corinthians, look at chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians verse 1. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. In the Bible, God, when he, when he told Israel back in the law in Deuteronomy about putting a man to death for breaking the law of Moses, particularly murder, they could not put a man to death, stone him to death, unless there were two or three eyewitnesses, two or more eyewitnesses, okay? In other words, I could, even if I saw the guy commit the murder, if I was the only one who saw him, God, God gives them the benefit of doubt because they're human. God knew he did it, and he'll pay for it. But one witness could not put a man to death, okay? One witness couldn't do it. That's why when Christ was, was, was unjustly condemned, they got false witnesses. They got false witnesses when Stephen said they committed, they broke the law by bearing false witness to get these two godly men uh, killed. You, what I'm saying is you're going to have two or three witnesses from Paul. You're going to have three witnesses from Paul about how to deal with the government. Now, let's go back to 
Romans 13. Let's read the chapter. I'm going to read it, and then we'll look at the other two witnesses. I believe that Romans 13 has to do with civil authorities. I'm going to prove by three passages in his epistles and many others from all of God's word. We're going to go look through the whole Bible. That we as grace believers are to submit and subject ourselves to the God-ordained civil authorities, even though those offices are held mostly by lost heathen men. I pray that you be as the Bereans of Acts 17. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. God put witnesses in his word for you to believe it. And I'm going to show you from Paul's epistles and then many other passages that what Paul is dealing with in Romans 13 is civil authorities, okay? He just dealt with, in chapter 12, how we deal with one another as saints in the local assembly. Then he goes out and says, don't avenge yourself against your enemy, those, those lost heathens around you. Let God, give God place. Give him place to deal with them. And I'm going to show you that the way God deals with the the evil in the world is by having law, authority to deal with it. And Paul's going to tell us that clearly. Let's read it. Verse 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works but to the evil. Wilt thou then be, I'm sorry, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. For for this cause pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending cont continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly co comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, not... I'm sorry, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wanton, wantonness, not in strife or envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now, from verses, from verses 1 through 8, what Paul is basically saying is to be a law-abiding citizen in whatever nation you're in as that Gentile who is saved, that grace believer, okay? Now, hold that thought. Let's look at two other passages where I believe Paul is dealing with this. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Here's the second witness from the mouth of the Apostle Paul. Second, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy 2. Look at verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth. Now, look at one more. Go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus 3. He says, verse 1, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, 
to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Now, in the context, he's going to, he's going to talk about what, how to deal with them, how to talk about it. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. What Paul is telling you there, he says, that's, these are the guys you're dealing with right here. They're foolish. I mean, a fool says in hearts to know God. So they, they're, they're, gonna be, they're not going to believe you're on your God. They're disobedient to God. They're deceived by people, by the spirits, uh, satanic spirits. They serve divers, lust and pleasures. They live in malice and envy and hateful. These are the people God is talking about. Verse 4, but after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Now, I'm going to stop right there, and we'll get back to this. We use that verse to show that salvation comes not by works, but by God's grace, and that's true. But when Paul quotes that in verse 5, He's saying that you're going to look at those lost people and their works aren't going to be righteous work. They're going to be unrighteous, but they're lost. And Paul's going to say, remember, that's not how God deals with people and saves people. They're, not, they're lost and they're going to be lost. Don't look at their works. Look at the fact that not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, God did not give us what we deserve. We all were like those lost people. Don't be surprised when they act lost. And that's what he's saying. And in the context, he's talking about the principalities, the powers. Paul understood the Roman Empire was corrupt. Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Paul understood Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't know that. But these instructions aren't from Paul. They're from the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> the one who Pontius Pilate crucified told Paul what to tell us Gentiles. Now, let's start back in Romans 13. I just wanted to set the stage. There's three witnesses out of Paul's epistles of what I believe is we grace believers are to live quiet and peaceable life. We're to pray for our, 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 our uh, civil authorities and submit ourselves. Now, let's look at the passage. We're going to go right down through it. Paul says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Notice here that the apostle says, let every soul. This is a decision you have to do. To let means you, 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 have, to give, you, you have to give permission. Paul wants you to do it willingly because we're going to see because God says so. But you don't have to do it. You can, you got free will. You can resist, but he's going to warn you that by, by resisting God's wisdom when dealing with the lost, lost or saved authorities, and he's going to say the same thing for wives, for children, stuff like that. What you're going to do is you're going to bring, when he says damnation, it, it, it's, that's like condemnation. There's going to be some punishment. That's what he means. Damnation in the Bible means punishment. The Lord would say the damnation of hell. There's punishment in hell. You're saved. You're not going to hell. So that damnation is not you losing your salvation. That damnation is you're going to be punished by these authorities. And we're going to see it. It's so clear in Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ, oh, it's, he, he was under that same authority. And he told Pontius, he says, you could have no power over me except to give it from above. So let's look at this. When he says let, that means you choose. This is something we choose to do to obey or disobey. We are to allow the doctrine that Paul gave us to work in our inner man. Because Paul knows that our outer man, our flesh, will desire to rebel against this command. And whether it's a wife with her husband, a man with the Lord, or children with their parents, when Paul gives commands about authority, your natural inclination in your flesh is to rebel against it. But Paul says, no, 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 let it work. These powers that are over us are going to be mostly idol worship and heathen Gentiles like we used to be. Okay? Therefore, in that same verse, he reminds us to not only do it because our father is the one who put, who put those positions of, of authority there. He himself ordained them. That means he prepared those ordinances to, to maintain order in the earth. See, God, he sees human, human race, and he wants it to go to the end. 
to do that back in, in Genesis, because the earth was so evil, he flooded the earth. Only eight people were saved. But he promised Noah, I will never flood, uh, uh, judge the earth with water. He's going to do it with fire one day. But he says, guess what? Now, because of man's evil continually from his youth, if a man sheds man's blood, Noah, by man shall his blood be shed. God set up some authority that to, to deal with evil. Okay? Now, let's look at this. There is no power in heaven or earth that God does not allow. In Job chapter 1 and 2, we see that the angels have a, a, a council meeting with, with God. Satan is there. Satan, God himself tells Satan, have you tried my servant Job? God did that. God says, hey, Job is a type of the little flock, the, the nation of Israel. God is the one who told Satan, have you tried my certain jo servant Job? And Satan says, no, he just serves you because you give him a lot of stuff. He says, nah, I know his heart. He loves me. And Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. God knew that Job didn't just love God because God gave him a lot of stuff and put a hedge around him. Satan, God took that hedge down and Satan touched everything Job had except his wife and his life. And he left his wife because she says, curse God and die. His wife was satanic. Well, here, look what he says. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. When you look at the book of Daniel, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, he says, hey, he says, the most high God ruleth in the, in the kingdom of men, and he sets the basis of men in there. That's in the book of Daniel. Just read it. Ne uh, Nebuchadnezzar was told by Daniel, the man of God, that you know what? You're in power because God put you there. And God put the basis of men. When you see that word basis of men, it means Regular lost heathen Gentiles God can use to, for his glory, okay? So that's what he's talking about. Paul, like the Lord Jesus Christ and all the Jewish apostles, lived under the brutal Roman Empire. But we will see that they too, including our Lord himself, submitted to those heathens, knowing that they were there by the will of God. The issue of powers that be go all the way back to Genesis 9, I told you. Because of man's unbridled evilness and the evilness God judged with the flood, man just did evil continually, and God set authority in the earth. Therefore, the, the, the Lord God told Noah in Genesis 9, he says about, you know, killing man. Now, how did God desire to require this blood? By giving the power to punish evildoers with death. This is where we get the idea of capital punishment. When God says, I will require the blood of man by man, he's not telling you to go and take the law into your own hands. Paul already told us in chapter 12 not to do that. What he means is there are authorities set up called the law, law enforcement officers, that you call, they come, and they beat down. You watch cops, right? They beat down the guys. God did that. If you watch that stuff, those heathens, they pray. I've seen them with signs that says, we do the work of God. Somehow, God put in man, even lost man, they understand we're doing this to stop evil so that human race can go on. Without law enforcement officers, do you know that Satan would have us exterminated first as grace believers? We're out there preaching a message against Satan. He would have all those heathens just destroy us all. But because of the penalty of, of jail, prison, punishment, death, we can come pretty much freely back and forth in our country. God did that. That's the grace of God, okay? Now, let's look at some of this. Go with me to Numbers chapter 35. We're going to go through some verses. Numbers 35. God didn't just let people take the law into their own hands. He set forth in the nation of Israel a system of government, okay? When you look at Israel, excuse me, when you look at Israel, you see a, a nation who has the Lord as their God. You see the wisdom of God in the nation of Israel. How they did things is how every nation should do things and will do things in the kingdom. The kingdom will be filled with Gentile nations. God will put those Gentile nations under the law. They will do things the way Israel did things. One of those things, Numbers 35, look at verse 31. Numbers 35, verse 31. So look at verse 30. Whosoever killeth any person, 
The murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of the murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. Here's what God is saying. If someone kills somebody, murders someone, and you have two or three witnesses to testify it, he's to die. And don't take any satisfaction. He couldn't get life in prison. He couldn't pay his way out of it. He has to die. Why? In the image of God created he man, he told Noah. And every time you murder a man or woman, a, 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 a mankind human, you are striking at God's marred image. It, it's sti we're still in the image of God, although it's marred by sin, but we're in his image. And God says that when you do that, you're attacking me, and you should take no satisfaction for the murder, okay? So you're not taking this law in your own hands. This is something the judges in Israel did, okay? It was a governmental thing. Their judges were their governors. Um, so who has the authority to actually do this punishing? Paul says in Romans 12 that we're not to take the law in our own hands. That is why God ordained governmental authorities to punish the evildoer and to protect and preserve human life. You see it with his program in the nation of Israel. Um, I, Deuteronomy 17, we don't need to, he's at the mouth of two or three witnesses, you should put the murderer to death. Um, go, go with me to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. We're just going through the scriptures to see how God, why he says this and, and see what he says about it. Look at verse 8, Deuteronomy 17, verse 8. Start at verse 6. At the mouth of two, two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to, be put to, uh, to put him to death. We, we do it like this. We call the witness and put him on the witness stand in a court of law. But in Israel, they laid hands on the guy saying to the judges, you know what? We saw this guy commit that murder. And those witnesses, those two or three or more, two or more witnesses put their hands on the man. And what they're doing is they're testifying before God and man that they're telling the truth. Now, if they bear false witness, God would tell Moses and then he would get them. But let's pretend like they're telling the truth. Here we go. They're telling the truth. Verse 7, and the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put to death. And afterwards, the hands of all the people. So thou shalt put the evil away from you. Notice that he uses the word evil. And Paul's going to say that it's to punish the evildoer. Okay? Verse 8, if there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, between matters of controversy within thy gates, that's the gates of Israel, then, thou shalt, then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt come unto the priests and Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. Notice that God told Israel to go to the judge. By the way, our judges are called judges because the Bible calls them judges. And the judge is to give a sentence of judgment. Judgment is justice applied. That's what judgment is. You take justice, you, 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 you give a sentence, and you apply that justice. It's called judgment. I want you to see at the end of verse 9, it's called the sentence of judgment. And so God had in the nation of Israel a set structure to deal with evil. And the reason I'm showing you this is because he hasn't changed that. And even though he's dealing with Gentiles, God in his providence, his foreknowledge, in every tribe on planet Earth, you can go to the, the, the middle of the, the, the bush, the Amazon bush. They have a system set up where they have tribal leaders. You, you Just read about it. They'll have a tribal um, chief. And all the matters run through him. If there was matters between two men in that tribe, they would come to the chief, and the chief would decide what to do, to the, even to, up to death. That's in everything. Where did they get that from? Why is it that every tribe on earth understands marriage? Woman, man, get together. They marry. Certain things God put in human nature, in, in humanity, for the propagation of the human race. Okay, That's what I want you to see here. Um, 
This did not change. Even after Israel's rebellion against God, he allowed and brought upon them Gentile powers called the times of the Gentiles, Assyria, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the Medes and Persians, Alexander the Great in Greece, then uh, Caesar and the Romans. And it is under that Roman Empire that the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul lived under. And I'm going to show you how they dealt. We're going to look at the Lord and Paul, how they dealt with those authorities, okay? Go with me, if you will, to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. I could show you Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar. He says, O king, live forever. He, he, he gave fear to the king, although Daniel's first uh, allegiance was to God. He did reverence the king, Nebuchadnezzar. He says, O king, live forever. What, what, what does he mean when he do that? He's giving him honor and reverence. But you can look at that on your own. We don't have that time. But John chapter 19, I want you to see this with the Lord Jesus. To me, this is the clear. I could stop right here, but I'm, I'm going to give you overwhelming evidence because some people are going to get this on, on DVD, and I want to prove what I believe. In John chapter 19, the Lord Jesus Christ is on a trial. It's some, it's some kangaroo court, some false witnesses set up. He knows it's a sham, but he's doing it for us. He did it for Israel to die, but he also, we found out from Paul, he shed his blood for the Gentiles. What you're going to see is him before the Roman governor, the guy who held his life in his hands. His name is Pontius Pilate. Uh, John chapter 19, look at verse 8. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, and that saying was that they said he says he's the son of God, he was the more afraid. Uh, Pilate had never seen a man like Jesus of Nazareth. Usually when Jews went to Pilate, they were cowering before him, and the Lord stood up there just like this. Didn't was nothing to him. Didn't bother him at all. Didn't bother him at all. And Pilate, when they say he was more afraid, he was afraid just watching the Lord stand in his presence and not shake like every other Jew that had ever been in his presence. And when they said he claims to be the son of God, he was more afraid. Now look at verse 9. And went again into the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. When it says, Whence art thou? Here's what he's saying. He's saying, Where are you from? Who are you and where are you from? Like Pilate was a Gentile heathen. He had all these gods. He thinking this guy is, is some extraterrestrial, some god. He says, whence art thou? Where are you from? Watch this. The Lord gave him no answer, right? Verse 9. Then Pilate said unto him, now watch his pride, Pilate's pride. Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have, what's that next word? I have what? Interesting, Paul says, he says, the powers that be, whosoever resisteth the power, same word. Now watch this. I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee. Pilate says, your life is in my hands. The Lord, he probably laughed. I, mean, I know he put in, I could see him inside, just, just so Gentile, heathen, dog, don't know nothing. I mean, think about it. He didn't have power over him. Not the way he thought. He did civilly, but not really, you know. Watch this. Verse 11. Jesus answered, thou couldest have. Now, by, by the way, notice that the Lord didn't say, you don't have power over me. I'm God. And uh, he says, thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from where? Notice that he didn't say, you don't have power over me. He goes, yeah, you got power over me, but let me, let me let you know where it's coming from. It's not you, Pilate. It's my father. The Lord Jesus Christ told this, this heathen Gentile, thou couldest have no power at all against me, except, exception, it were given thee from where? The Lord knew that the Roman Empire was in power because of what Israel did and their sins, and God put them under the times of those Gentiles. He sat before Pilate right here before the cross and said, yeah, you got power over me, but it's really my father. Don't take the credit. He, he did it. When Paul says that the powers that be are ordained of God, that's what you see the Lord himself dealing with. Let's keep reading. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now, what's going on there? 
because of who you are in Christ, you may get persecuted by those authorities. It happened to Paul, it happened to the Lord. We're going to see that when it happened to Paul because of the ministry and they put out a warrant against him for preaching, and Satan, that was the thorn in his flesh, satanic men. Paul, God had Paul get out of there. We're going to see that the, the disciples let him down when the governor of Damascus was after him with a warrant. They secretly let him down the wall in a basket. That, you know, you got, that's how they did it in that day, let you down the wall. And he got out. But the Lord did not go against that, even though they were, they were persecuting for who he was, because he had to die, okay? He, he, it was time for him to die. One day they went to get him. The, the chief priest guards went to get him. And it says that as they tried to lay hands on him, he just walked away. And they couldn't get him. What happened? It says his time had not yet come. When they went to get him, they could literally not grab him. He just walked away from them, and they were just stunned. When they came to get him, 666 men came to get him. They said, are you Jesus of Nazareth? He says, I am. And what happened? They fell down. All of them. They fell down. They get up again and ask him, are you Jesus now? He says, I am. And they fell down. Think about that. What he was showing was his power. That happened in the book of John. All those men fell down. Type of the Antichrist, him destroying them with his word. I am Jehovah, and he's going to destroy the Antichrist. What I'm showing you is, if God wanted to, the Lord told him, he says, if I want it, I can call 12 legions of angels to deliver me. The Lord de dealt with it because he was going to die. But we're going to see that the only time that God allowed believers to rebel against authority, allow wives to rebel against authority, allow children to rebel against authority that he put them under is when that authority tells you something against the word of God. That's the only time. Now watch this. Let's, let's, let's finish reading this passage. And verse 12, and from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not whose friend? Caesar's friend, the, the king. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So what they did, they put political pressure on Pontius Pilate. He had already decided that Christ was innocent. He tried to, by the way, when he went back into the judgment hall, he went out there and told those Jews, I find no fault in this man. I wash my hands. They go, no, no, no. If you don't do this, we're going to tell Caesar. See, Pontius was the Roman governor of Judea. But he was under the authority of a man named Caesar. The title Caesar, uh, you heard of Caesar Augustus in that time? Pontius had a head, and he worried about what if, if that word got back to Rome. He's in Judea, in Israel, but word would have got back to Rome, and Caesar probably would have had his head if it was an uproar of those Jews. So for political pressure, Pontius Pilate crucified the Lord, okay? By the way, look at the end of verse 11. Therefore he hath delivered me unto thee. He, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now, he's not talking about the Lord. He's not talking about the Father. Who is he talking about? Judas. Judas. Notice, by the way, Pilate will be judged for, 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 for being evil, for crucifying the Son of God. But his sin will be less than Judas' sin. See, there are there are sins, but there are greater punishment for sins and lesser. If you tell a lie, the only person, you tell a lie to your, to your spouse and they find out, you know, depending on the lie, how grievous it is, you're going to have to deal with some, some, some stuff. But if you go out and murder someone as a believer, that sin has greater punishment than another sin. You know, so there are different, when he talks about the greater sin, because Judas knew who he was and delivered him over to, to the authorities, he betrayed the Lord then Judas will be judged harsher by the Lord Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment. When Pontius Pilate get to the great white throne judgment, if he, hadn't, if he didn't trust the Lord, we don't know. He might have believed somewhere in there. might not. But if he didn't, at the great white throne judgment, he won't be judged as harshly as Judas. Okay, that's what he's saying. Now, Just so you know that all the Jews knew clearly of Pontius' power, God the Holy Ghost wrote in the book of Luke, go, go to Luke chapter 20. We've got about 15 minutes. Luke 20. Look at what he wrote in Luke chapter 20. This wasn't just something the Lord knew. All the Jews of uh, Paul's day and the Lord's day knew this. Luke chapter 20, verse 19. 
And I appreciate you bearing with me, but what I'm doing, because I know it's been taped, people need to know why Paul says what he says in Romans 13, 1 Timothy 2, and Titus 3. Luke chapter 20, look at verse 19. And the chief priests and the scribes the same hour sought to lay hands on him. And they feared the people, for, th for they, the people, uh, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. So Christ spoke a parable. He was talking about the uh, chief priest and scribe. Verse 20. And they watched him and sent forth spies which should feign themselves just men. Now here's what they're doing. They're, they're taking counsel to catch him in his word. So what the chief priest of Israel do is they send spies who pretend like they believe Jesus Christ. Pretend they were just men. They, 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 they're talking to him. They're saying, oh, yeah, master. And you see it all the time. They would come and they'd test him, try to catch him in his words. This was all a conspiracy to catch him to do something. Watch this. Um, the spies, verse 20, which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words. Why? That so they might deliver him unto the what? Power and authority of who? The governor. Notice this, how the Bible puts that. They wanted to catch him saying something against Rome so that they could take him to Pilate. That's what they were doing in John chapter 20. They took him to Pilate and kept saying, he said this against Caesar. He said it. He said it. Get him. Get him. Because they were lying, by the way. They, they twisted his words. But notice that it's called power and authority. I'm showing you that when Paul mentions power, he's talking about the civil authorities. Authority, he's talking about the civil authorities in that passage. And what these guys did, you ever notice? Go over to chapter 20, verse 22 of Luke. You've heard of the whole render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God. Why, why, did, why did that take place? Well, it's because they're trying to catch him. Here's what they did. Verse 22, is it lawful for us to give tribute? Now, we're going to look at tribute later in another study, but I want you to see something. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? The word tribute, we use the word taxes in our, in our vernacular, okay? We don't, I mean, sometimes they use tribute, but it really taxes. They're asking him, should us Jews pay taxes to Caesar? That's what they're doing. They think they're going to catch him. Now watch what he does. I, the Lord is so, so wise. Verse 23, but he perceived their what? Craft. They're trying to, how are you going to try to catch the Lord? He catches the wise in their own craftings. Watch what he does. And said unto them, why tempt ye me? Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription hath it? The reason why we have coins with presidents on them and stuff like that is this is what the Romans did. And even before that, you put the, you put the, the image of the head of your state. That's why we got presidents. Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. Dollar bills. We got the presidents right there in the middle. 20s, 100s, all these different presidents. That's come from that, that culture where you put the head. So Caesar is on these coins. He says, give me a coin. He takes the coin and looks at it. By the way, the coins were minted by Rome. He says, show me a penny, verse 24. Whose image and superscription hath it? Whose face is on it? And whose words is written on there? Whose name is written there? And they said, look what he says. They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said unto them, render therefore unto Caesar. I could see him just flipping. Here you go. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things which be God's. See, these old sorry unbelievers trying to catch him in his words, and they were the ones who were supposed to be teaching the nation of Israel God's word, and they're getting bogged down in these things. And he says, here. Give Caesar his thing. He's saying, yes, give him, give him what's theirs. And we're going to see more about this. They asked Peter, does your master pay tribute, taxes? He says, yes. What I'm going to show you is that the Lord Jesus Christ knew that these guys were scoundrels. He knew that the Roman Empire didn't use those taxes that he, they were taking from the Jews right. Matthew was a tax collector. He sit at the seat of custom like this, and as Jews would enter into the city, the Roman Empire would take money from them. We call it, uh, you know, like toll booths or custom. You know, you go through 
uh, the, the different states. Well, they did that. And they would tax the Romans to death, um, tax the Jews to death. And that's why people hated the tax collectors, because there was Jews taken from their own people. Okay? But we'll see that later. My point is, the Lord Jesus Christ understood what was going on. He wasn't oblivious to the misuse of funds, the corruption at the top, the corruption at the bottom of the political system. We're going to see, he's going to say, lest they be offended, just do it. Just, just, just do it. And because guess what? He's telling them, I'm coming. I'm going to make things right. That's what he's saying. But until I make things right, just go along with the program. That's what he's saying. Okay? Um, we're coming down to the end of this study. We're going we're gonna to pick up more. But as we, we're going to conclude this session, but I want you to go to Peter. It's 1 Peter chapter 2. Because Peter is going to say something eerily similar to what Paul says, and it has a future connotation to the nation of Israel. 1 Peter 2. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2, if you will. Now, I usually don't preach from words and stuff like that, so it's a little tougher. I'm more uh, impromptu with my preaching. But I just want to make sure I hit on all these things because this is important, you know. A brother asked me to put it in writing so he can compare what Dwayne wrote, what I wrote, and I put it in writing. In 1 Peter chapter 2, tell me if this doesn't sound similarly similar to what Paul says in Romans 13. Now, who is, who is Paul writing to? I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Who is Peter? Peter is the apostle of the nation of Israel. Christ in, in Matthew 16 gave to Peter alone, and then later uh, he gave the other guys power. But Peter is the head apostle. He has a, a, he don't need two or three witnesses to do things. Peter can do stuff in Christ's stead in Israel himself. And watch what he says to the nation of Israel here. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, he's speaking to the little flock, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Now, why did he call them strangers and pilgrims? Because he started off, they're scattered abroad amongst the nations. They're scattered. And they're among, they live in with Gentiles and live in under Gentile authorities. You do know that Jews are all over the world today. They're Jews who live right here in America, and they got to deal with the laws. So in that day, Peter's going to tell them how to do that. Now watch this. As strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts, they war against the soul, so he tells them how to behave themselves, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Notice that they're among the Gentiles. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Here's what he's saying. As they operate outside of the nation of Israel amongst the Gentiles, believing the word of God through Peter and, and, and the guys, he's talking about the day of visitation when Christ comes back. Okay? That's the second coming. Watch this. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Now, Paul didn't say, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for, Paul's sake, for, for God, for the Lord's sake. Paul said it like this. It, it's, it's similar, though. Similar. He says just like this. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that be ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Now watch this. Paul says it's the ordinance of God, but Peter just says it in a different way. He says, he says submit, verse 13 of 1 Peter 2, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. That's the same thing. To, to do something for the Lord's sake is you're doing it because he says to do it. Paul says it's the ordinance of God. Peter says the ordinance of man for, for the Lord's sake. Now, now watch this. Look at verse 13. Whether it be to the king as supreme, he's saying, now, we don't have kings, but you know, you know what I'm saying, the authority. They had kings. The Roman uh, government uh, was a king. They had a king. They had a senate and all that. But Caesar was king. Whether it be for, to the king as supreme, but not just the king. Look at verse 14. Or unto governors. Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor. They are under the king. President Bush is the head of our nation. 
but Tim Pawlenty is the governor of the state of Minnesota. He is the head of this region, okay? So governors. As unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers. The sent by him there is the Lord. When he says by the Lord, say, it's, yes, it's the king, but he's telling you it's, it's the Lord's sake. Sent by him for the punishment of what? Evil doers. Watch what Paul says. Verse 4. For rulers, I'm sorry, verse 3 of Romans 13. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. He sent by God to execute wrath on him that doeth evil. They're saying the same things to the people who they're the apostle to. Peter is telling the Jews, these people are there to punish evildoers and, watch this, for the praise, 1 Peter 2.14, of them that do well. Paul goes, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. I'm sorry. Um, do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. They're basically saying the same thing. All right, keep going. Uh, 1 Peter 2, we'll end here in verse 15 and 16. For so is the will of who? Whose will is it? God's. That with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, he's saying you're free. You're God's children, you're free. And not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. Don't say, wait a minute. I'm a child of God. I'm free. And, and Paul says, don't use that same malice. You can't, don't be attacking those guys. God has a greater purpose. Your flesh is going to want to, oh, oh, oh. Watch this, watch this. But as the servants of God, understand you're serving God. Verse 17, honor all men. Love the brotherhood. That's your brethren. Fear God. Honor the who? Paul says, give honor to whom honor is due. They're saying the same thing. Now, to me, it's clear. And I know it might be clear to you all, but I have to teach it like this, especially put it on tape, because there are saints who don't see it this way. I, I, that's their prerogative. But I do know something. What you believe will be manifest in your life. It will have consequences. To me, this is sound Pauline doctrine. Just admit, it's sound it's sound doctrine of Israel through Peter. I mean, he says, honor the king. And in this context, he starts to talk about other people, servants. Be subject to your masters. He, t he says in chapter 3, he's still talking about, he's going, likewise, ye wives. Now, now watch this. We're going to end here. This blows me away. Likewise, ye wives. Be in subjection to your own husbands that, if any, obey not the word. You don't even have an excuse if you're if your authority is a lost person. Our authorities in our government are lost people for the most part. I'm a couple of saved people. You might be a saved wife whose your husband is lost. You might be a child where, where your family is lost. You could be a teenager who believes on the Lord Jesus and your parents are lost, and, and, and Paul will tell you to obey your parents in the Lord. Now, we're not going to get to it today, but next week, I'm going to show you that there are times where you can rebel and must rebel against the authority. But God only gives us one reason to do it. One. Just one. And that reason is when that authority tells you to do something against the will of a higher authority, and that's God. Peter's going to say, we ought to obey God rather than man. You judge whether we should obey you over God. Paul, as they're trying to get him to stop preaching Christ, they put a warrant out for him. He left. He told the Thessalonians, I want to come back there, but Satan is hindering me. He was hindering me because there were people out to get him, to arrest him. He spent most of the last years of his ministry in a Roman prison, and Paul was like, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. It's my personal opinion that, they did that God did that to protect Paul to write the rest of the epistles because men kept trying to kill him using government authorities to try to kill him. So God put him under the, 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 the guard of Rome, but they also let him talk to the Tertius, and he wrote, you know, they, they wrote down stuff. 
He says, I'm bound, but the word of God is not bound. It was actually the grace of God that put Paul in prison. He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm going to explain all that. Thank you all for bearing with me. You know, there are saints who don't see it this way. That's fine. My job is I go through the Bible. I can't skip passages. I got to teach what I see. And I, I know you guys respect that and appreciate that. But there are saints who, who, who think that we grace believers are free and don't need to submit to the authorities. I don't see that. And I'm going to show you that what I see with Paul is that we're to do that until they say you can't worship the Lord Jesus. And then you're willing to suffer for it. The only time Paul went to prison was when they told him to stop preaching Christ. And he says, I'm not. And they finally called him. And he says, I'm suffering for Christ's sake. The only time you and I are to do evil in the eyes of the government is if they tell us to stop preaching Jesus Christ and we continue to do it, okay? That's what I see. So let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the truth of your word. Our Father, I thank you for saints. Um, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. We do thank you uh, for a country that we can come freely like this because we know that there are brethren Christians who don't have the freedom we have, yet they still meet. Uh, I know brethren in China right now, as the Olympics going on, they're trying to persecute our Christian brethren and house churches there. The government is communist. They're trying to get rid of But those people are still meeting even though the government says not to. Well, what is that? Well, that, that's because they have a higher authority than that, and that's the fact that they need to worship the Lord Jesus Christ according to your will. Father, we thank you that we live in a country right now that we have the freedom. We, we, we don't want to take that for granted because uh, just like we have that freedom, we could be like our brethren in other nations that don't have that complete freedom that we have to worship you. But while we do, Father, we give you thanks and praise for it anyway. And we ask that uh, you just bless the rest of our uh, morning uh, as we take our break for the next session. We thank you in Christ's name.